All right, then I am going to start. Welcome. <clears throat> I am supposed to keep reminding people at least at the beginning of the semester that um, these sessions are being recorded. So anything that you say into your mic that's not muted will appear as part of the lecture here. All right. So welcome, like I said, this class has changed over the last year. It has gone through a change in name, change in number, and a change in content. All right, maybe I told you this before, maybe I didn't, and I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, every spring, we have a meeting, uh, an AWD alumni meeting, and you two, you or you, you all of you will be invited to that um, next year. All right, not in 2023 because you'll still be students, but in 2024, and it's open. You can say whatever you want to say about anything. But one of the things that we asked the last time we had it, we had about seven or eight people, and um, the overriding theme was although people liked the fact that we were teaching Java, no one was getting a job as an Android programmer. So the decision was made by not by me at all, but by people higher up than me was that we were going to change the content of this class. So rather than than um, than teaching uh, Android development, we would be basically teaching C sharp website development. So that's that's the short story behind it. All right, so meet at the same time we met last semester. I am literally at my house right now, you know, from my house. Hopefully somebody let them in. Um, good, hello, Clayton. Um, and uh, I technically don't have to go in at all this semester. Last semester, I was expected to go in one day a week because I still had students in the class last semester who had started in a non-online format when they started the program, but now, and I'm not saying I can go in whenever I want to, but the problem is they now they have no place for me. So if I do have to go in to uh, to lecture, it'll only be because the Internet at my house has gone up or gone out, I should say. OK, so when you look at this. As far as the stuff that's in here that you see in here. There's not a whole heck of a lot right now. We're going to have to rewrite some of the program level outcomes. I'd say the one that's most relevant in here is we are still going to be working with object oriented programming principles and fundamentals, and we are still going to be using version control. All right, the book and hopefully you've all gotten a chance. Um, to get the book, the first two chapters, I think I sent them to you. I don't remember if I did or not, but they're available for free online if you go out to muroc.com we're going to go over chapter one today and probably you know regardless of what it says here on the syllabus we'll see how it goes and if possible we'll go through chapters two and three tomorrow chapter three you already know it's 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 basically a chapter on bootstrap all right i don't want to go too fast in here i know last semester we had a tendency that we went too slow now, some of the people in the class had things going on in their life that they didn't have plan on ha happening that happened. I get all that. But I will tell you that I'm going to do the best I can so that every week you know exactly what we're going through and that's what the lecture will be on. All right, because like I said, I deviated from that last semester and I don't want to do that anymore. Now, with that said, because I can talk to the, those of you in this class when I, I just finished a three hour lecture for, for the morning class, I've got 10 in there and six of the 10 are newbies. And uh, some of them, I mean, we did everything. We, we, we installed Visual Studio Code, we installed Git, they set up GitHub accounts and some people had problems, you know, doing some of that stuff. So I did not really want to go into when stuff is due, et cetera, but I can, I believe with you guys. So there is a schedule when stuff is going to be due. It will be expected that the stuff is going to be turned in by that time. That'll make it much easier on all of us. All right, if we can stick to that schedule. So the course description, you can read this all you want. All right, 
The only thing that really has changed a lot in this course description from what we had before is we took out the Java and the uh, Android references, okay? When you look at this right now, this doesn't look that different. This doesn't look that different from a lot of the stuff that you had last semester in the AWD 1111 class. So let's quickly talk about what is different. Well, we're going to be really, really concentrating on MVC. All right, model view controller. The only database we're going to be working with is SQL Server. All right. And um, we're still going to be talking about full stack apps, et cetera. We still want them to look great. We still want them to act responsively. All right, et cetera. But when you look in here, there's again, like I said, there's a lot of similarity between this and what we did last semester. There's also differences. We didn't talk much last semester about authentication and authorization. We're going to do that almost right away. All right, if we don't do it tomorrow, we'll do it Tuesday of next week. OK, and um, we're already going to look at uh, an MVC app today. Well, if nothing else, we'll look at the one at the end of chapter one that the author gives you. All right, in here, the way that MVC is done is going to look a lot different. Let's just put it that way. All right, you'll learn a lot about testing and debugging, but you know what? It hasn't changed that much from the C-sharp class. And what I mean is you can set breakpoints, also known as trace points. All right, you, you, you've got a locals window, you've got a watch window, et cetera. So that stuff isn't really going to change. They do talk a little bit in chapter one about testing and debugging, but they have a, a later chapter, I think it's chapter five, that's just dedicated to that. All right, we'll talk about session state, we'll talk about cookies, okay. I already mentioned the authentication and authorization. Now, since this is an online course, you get a maximum number of absences at two. All right, after two, I'm supposed to manually drop you from the class. This will work the same way that it worked last semester. And what I mean is you have nothing that's due this Sunday, but let's pretend for a moment that you had chapter one, you had some work due from chapter one on Sunday. And let's assume that it was that there was a lec one lecture or one lab assignment, one homework assignment, and one written test. If you turn in anything, as far as what's due that week, you're marked present, all right? But I, I just can't do what I did last semester, and that is let some of you turn in stuff as late as you did. Like I said, it skewed the class. The class wasn't as good as it could have been, and I let that drive the class. That's on me. I shouldn't have done that. I'm not going to do that this semester. That's not a threat. I'm just trying to be honest with everybody from the start. All right, so again, if you got, if you turn in nothing, so if we had that stuff due this week and you turned in nothing, I look on Monday, there's nothing there. All right, you will be marked absent for that day before. I take attendance for the course, I take attendance on Monday. And I do that by looking to see if people have turned in stuff to me. All right, that's how I've done it in the past. That's why I will continue to do it. All right, the honesty, you know, again, I just, I, that's not really been a problem with any of you in here. All right, the grading has not changed. You know, or you should know by now that even though D is shown on there, you don't ever get a D from Rankin. All right, you get an A, a B, a C, or an F. Okay. I had a long talk with the people this morning, and, and you, some of you have asked this too, not so much for this class, but how much work do I have to do outside of class? It depends on the person. That's all I can tell you. Inside Rankin is your go-to place for virtually anything. I have not set up the system in there for the grade book where I've got all the stuff in there. I hope to be able to do that all this weekend. All right, and usually what I do is I don't turn things on in there until I know exactly when they're due. But if I set everything up this weekend, I might turn everything on. Now, with that said, I might only have 
actual dates for the, the, the first three chapters. Then when we get there, then I can do the do the uh, the dates for the next two chapters, et cetera, just so you're aware of what's going on. All right. Some of you I know have ta have talked directly with with uh, Patrick. All right. And again, um, getting a tutor for this class is probably going to be difficult. All right. Just because of the fact that unless somebody um, already knows ASP.net, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of help, extra help that can be provided for you. But if if that's needed, we'll try. All right. The disabilities thing, I think it's kind of moot in here because first of all, I don't think any of you have any disabilities. But second of all, you know how it's set up with assignments and with tests. It'll be set up the same way. If you have not already done so, please sign up for the rank and connection as soon as you can. If you have not done that already. Also, and I'm not I'm not mentioning names, but some I've got a former student who contacted me about using me as a reference and, and some other stuff. And I went out and I said, make sure your LinkedIn account is up to date. And I went out to LinkedIn and it wasn't up to date. All right. I what I'm going to do is later on in this semester, and I don't know if she's going to be interested in this or not, or if she's going to want to do this or not. But when this was when this class was held in the classroom, I had a woman who is an IT recruiter out of St. Louis. I had her come in every semester and talk to students. All right. What I'd like to be able to do is, you know, somewhere April in the Aprilish time frame, somewhere in there. OK, I'd like to be able to have her come back in and we'll do we do a team's meeting, but she can come in and talk about what people are looking for. Give maybe a 30 to 45 minute shtick, which is what she usually does, and then take questions from you. All right. Like I said, we'll do that later. Now, last semester, you guys weren't in this. It was for just for the second year peeper, people. But since you are now all second year people, I wanted to show you this. I mean, give me a second here. Uh, Clayton, I, I hope, hopefully, oh, that's okay. I thought you maybe weren't on, but I guess you are. All right. Um, I got this thing from Evan. And okay. What's going to happen on February 24th, which is a Friday, which I know is normally our lab day. But on February 24th, he's going to have people come in, not to his classroom. They actually use the auditorium at the St. Louis campus. And these are people from Latos. They work with Scott Air Force Base and some other places. And to my knowledge, they've hired between a dozen and two dozen graduates of Rankin. Most of the ones they've hired have been from the regular IT or the hardware program, but they've hired a couple of Evans students as well. All right. And these people come in and they talk about it. You know, they give a briefing, et cetera, but they are always looking for people. And now last year I listened to it with my second year people and they said their starting salary is 55. And in, to my, in my opinion, that's nothing to sneeze at. So on that date, and I'll let you know way ahead of time, all right, on that date, we can plan on, you know, if you don't want to, you know, if it's a lab, I'll still make it a lab day. If you don't want to listen to it, you don't have to, but I'm going to be, and I'll provide a link to everybody. When they did it last time, I think it's from like about 1230 to two, it was about an hour and a half long presentation. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say about the schedule is just so you're aware of this. Four weeks from Friday, I have to go in for a colonoscopy. All right. I don't normally like to talk about my personal life, but the point is on that day, because I've had two of them before and I'm having my third. All right. There that, that is basically when they check you out for colon cancer. And on that day, I've already talked to Mr. Corrigan. Um, what it, it's mine, they couldn't get me in until noon. So basically I'll be unavailable that day for class. It will be a lab day. It's a Friday. 
but just so you're aware of that. And I'll remind you of it again uh, when we get closer to that date. All right. Okay, so again, assume classes will always be held. If on the remote chance, because this happened last semester, that my internet goes out here and I have to run into the um, Rankin-Wentzville campus, I will do that, but I'll again, I'll let everybody know. So let's just take a look at what's in here. All right, so it's got the class introduction, which we're doing now. Second thing in here is the student handbook. If you're not aware of this, you probably are. But if you're not aware of this, if you go out to the school's website, you know, just rankin.edu, and you search in here for handbook, all right, there it is. There's the student handbook. All right, so you can actually download it as a PDF or look at it, et cetera if that ever becomes any kind of an issue for you. All right, work ethic. Now, I'm not sure in the past, and if, you're, if you haven't been, it's my fault, but in the past, there have been some glitches with our work ethic system. You've all get work ethic, work ethic grades, but you may or may not have been able to see them. Hopefully that glitch has been repaired. And I was on, on an email with somebody this morning on this, and you will be able to tell what your grade is. Most of you, if you don't remember this, and you probably do, but most of you, if you don't remember this, these are your four work ethic grade possibilities. Does not meet, needs improvement, meets expectations, or exceeds expectations, all right? The majority of my students, probably 90 some percent, get this, you come to class, you do assignments, you turn in work when it's due. All right, now, so who exceeds expectations? It's if somebody comes in and says, hey, if you need a tutor for the AWD 1000 class, I'll be happy to, to do that. Um, I can set up a Discord server and we can, we can basically set up a study group for the class. That's people who are going above and beyond where they have to go. All right, so just so you're aware of that. All right, the um, review of C Sharp, OOP, and SQL Server. Well, one thing I did provide for you, hopefully you all got it. Let me see if I can bring that up. Uh, no, that's Evans, I don't need that. Well, I sent you two of them. Let me grab the other one that I sent out. There we go. And we're this is we're just getting into this then right now. And that is this. In order to be able to do the work that's required for this class, some of you, when we downloaded Visual Studio 2022, Community 2022, you may still have it on your computer. Some of you may not. All right. So I tried to come in here and I sent all I sent this to all of you. When was it? A, a couple of days ago. Yeah, it was on Monday. And I said, if you have uninstalled Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition since that class, here are the steps to go through to do it, all right? Now, when we've done it in the past, these are the only two things that we have set up, all right? We have set up .NET desktop development and data storage. The .NET desktop development was for all the Windows Forms projects we created. The data storage was when we got into the database. You have to add those, but you also have to add, and this is right near the top, ASP.NET and web development. So you have to choose that one. So if you already have the system, if you've got Visual Studio set up already, you should be able, and you can tell by going in here and looking, but if I go down to Visual Studio here, there is a, where is it? There is a video Visual Studio installer right there. If I click on this, now I've got, I've got three versions on here. I know you don't. So I'm just gonna, you know, you have just the 2022 one. 
But if you go there and you click modify, this is the one right here you'll need, ASP.NET and web development. You already should, if you've got this downloaded, you already should have the .NET desktop development. Keep that there. You should have the data storage and processing. Keep that there. But to my knowledge, at least, you shouldn't need any of the other things that are in here. But like I said, you definitely will need that one. So when you check that, there'll be a thing in here that says install while while up while downloading, and then there'll be a button to let you do it. And just click the button. That may take quite a bit of time. And if if you have, have not don't have Visual Studio at all and you have to go through the whole process, that may take you up to an hour. All right, especially it may even be longer if you've got a very slow internet connection. That's why I sent you this the other day. All right. So if you've not uninstalled it, basically all you have to do is, like I said, go out to the installer and add the ASP.NET and web development checkbox. Then it says choose the install while downloading and then click on the modify button. OK, so hopefully that's clear enough that that makes sense enough so that you can do it. All right. OK, then. If you did that, if you still have that stuff there, I'm going to show you what I have on my system. All right, because it's not going to be exactly what I've shown you over here. So if I go out here to Microsoft SQL Server 2019, I've got that. I've got 2019. The newest one, I think they have one for 2022. But I believe if you want to, you can still choose the one for 2019. That's the one I'm going to be using. Why? Because I already had it installed. I already wrote a couple programs and they worked. All right. So if you use 2022, could it be problematic? I don't know. That's all I'm telling you. But if you do go out here to that URL, if you go out to the SQL server downloads, so if I go out there and go over to here, Notice that by default, this is the one I tell you to choose, which is Express. I don't know if you can search through here and you, you know, or, or just search on Google and do a download of 2019. All right, because that's the one that I have. I don't know if it's going to matter if I've got one and you've got the other or not. I'll be honest with you, I'm too freaking afraid to get rid of my 2019 and add 2022 in case I break something, all right? I just don't wanna do that. But my guess is if you come in here and you Google download SQL server 2019, that somewhere in there, there's a download and install, all right? I'm not sure if that'd be the one, I, I'm gonna check them all out first. No, you don't wanna pay anything for it. But they're from Microsoft. All right, but that looks like the same one that we already had. So I don't know in there. All right, with 2019, exactly what you'd have to do. There's download SQL Server 2019. Well, I don't know. I'd have to go and take a look at it. All right. I also recommend that you choose that you have Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio 18. I think that is the newest and it's 18 point something now. But again, if I come down here, under server tools 18, you'll notice I have Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. I tried to put relevant links in here, all right? If you try it and you have any problems, please let me know, all right? And we'll have to work our way through it. I'm hoping we don't have any problems with that. All right, so that was that. Now, in chapter two, in chapter two of our book, which we will be going through tomorrow, tomorrow we will go through chapter two and chapter three. That's the plan. And then Friday will be our regular lab day. All right. But in chapter two in the book, what the authors have done is they have written, as they often do in Muroc textbooks, they have written a future value ASP.NET program. All right. 
Well, for the review, what I did was I went back and I rewrote their future value program as first a C-sharp console app. Then I went back and rewrote it as a C-sharp Windows Forms app with no validation. Then I went and wrote it as a va with validation that has if statements. Then I went and wrote it as a validation that has try catch with some if statements. Then I went back and wrote it again where we use that validator class. All right, I didn't do it exactly the way we did it in the book, but it's pretty much the same thing. I am going to take that tomorrow and rather than send it out to you, I may have already put it out, I don't remember, but if it's not out there on GitHub already, I will put it out there by tomorrow. So you'll be able to take a look at that. You don't have to do anything with it, nothing. But what you might wanna do is download it and have the code up. So as I'm going through, I'm just gonna follow the book and I'm gonna rewrite this, the future value as they do it in the book but while I'm doing it, there'll be a few things that I'll be discussing that aren't exactly in the chapter, all right, but that are relevant to what we're working on, all right? So as it says, that that's what we're doing today, and I've got this all week. You know, and Evan, Evan and I have been in, in constant communication. Evan has not taught this class before. Actually, four years ago, this class was taught for one year the way it's going to be taught now with C sharp. So I did teach it once before, but he and I were, were we had a meeting for about an hour yesterday, a Teams meeting. He is going to um, look at my tests and probably use them. All right, and the homeworks we're doing are going to be the same, etc. So the classes are basically going to be mirror images of one another. All right. Now one thing that he did that I did not do last semester, and I wish I would have, is he has gone through and he has weighted stuff, W-E-I-G-H-T-E-D. What do I mean? I wanna show you. So this was yesterday, and I took screenshots from the meeting. So you'll notice his is gonna be broken up like this. Final project, hands-on tests, homework, and lab assignments. All right. And he the written tests are what he's calling one of these two. I don't remember. He's still doing all the homework and all the labs that I'm doing, but I think he's calling all of those homework and the written tests he's calling lab assignments. Mine will look like his, except I didn't I broke I actually broke it down into five and called one written tests. The other thing that he did, like I said, I didn't do this this year. He did, and I think it works out better if I can find the doggone one in here. Oh, let me look. We're going to find it. It's right here. There it is. Is he wait? He's waiting things. So when you look right there, the final project will be worth 10%, regardless of the number of points. This is the whole thing for the semester. The hands-on tests will be 30%. The homework will be 10%. And the labs will be 50%. This homework is, again, that's what he called the uh, written tests. So I'm going to do something similar to that. But again, unlike last semester, you know, if you don't have stuff in on time, you're going to get dinged big time. All right, that's not a threat. It's just much easier for me to grade all of these at once and have a good, complete picture of where people are, as opposed to having stuff turned in one, two, whatever weeks late. So I don't want to have that happen anymore. All right. So again, like I said, this will change. Tomorrow you can plan on us going through chapter two and chapter three. So we're going to start on chapter one in just a moment. I think we'll have time to finish it, go over what's at the end of the chapter, Etc. And I'll still get you out of here probably by three o'clock today. All right. I am setting it up so that right now it's 1235. I it's just on the hour, I'm going to give you a 10-minute break. So at one o'clock till 110, I'm going to pick it up right at 110, at 110 to two o'clock, etc. So that's the way it's going to work all semester. I told that to be to the 
earlier class, I'm telling that to you guys as well. All right. Now, uh, a couple of you have already sent me invites to the GitHub repo, which is good. All right. In your GitHub repo, which is out there right now, All right, so if I go out to the GitHub repo, there it is. Okay, and I already sent you the link and everything to it. So this is what's out there. I'm not sure what one, pl one place where Evan and I sort of disagree is, and, and he's, he's right more than I am, but um, in every class he teaches, he's had the students do a, uh, a final project. I am doing that this semester. We may end up doing a final project together for a mythical company, and I've already created the database for it. You've seen some of this because we looked at some of this when we did some of the MySQL exercises. Evan doesn't want to do that. He right now is, is, t is tending or trending more towards what he calls a passion project. So let's assume that Michael here really likes basketball, and he wants to do some kind of an ASP.NET project on the NBA. I don't know what it would be. You could do that. Whereas John likes the NFL, so he does a thing on that, etc. I may I may very well go that route as well. I don't know. All right. Now for the homework and for the labs, all right, th this is the stuff that I get from Muroc. So you'll have homework. There's a case study in there that's a running case study. You'll be building a site all semester, all right? And the labs will be somewhat at least similar to the kind of labs that we've had before. Don't worry about that. You'll, you'll Again, if you haven't looked at them, we can if you need to take a look at them later, all right? So you've got all that stuff, good, bad, or indifferent. So good, bad, or indifferent, there are written tests here. Now, the good news is some of the written tests are as small as five questions. I think the longest one might be 20 questions. All right, but on average, I'd say there's about 12 questions. It's Muroc, so they are um, multiple choice. All right, I asked Evan right away, are you giving those? And he said, darn right I am. All right, he's doing it. I'm trying to be consistent with him. So I said, fine, I'll do the same. The slides are right out of the Muroc textbook. What I'm hoping to do is to do some some actual presentations that I'm going to create under Camtasia for each chapter for the PowerPoints that we get. I've done chapter one. I didn't even put it out there yet, but that's the only one that right now that I have finished. All right. Now, I have found this site, and I just wanted to show it to you. Again, I don't want to waste my time or your time, but going out to YouTube, there are tons of sites out here. Some are real good, some are pretty good, some are not good, and you know that. But I found this thing accidentally when looking for something else, and it's called Simply Learn. So S-M-P-L-I, learn, all right? And I don't know how many videos they have out here. If you told me it was a thousand, I'd believe you because I kept working my way through it and through it and through it and through it. And it's not set up real well. Their playlists aren't really set up. They're not real consistent is what I'm telling you. All right. But they've got so many videos in here on virtually anything you can think of. I wish I'd have found this before last semester. I watched a couple of their Node videos that I thought were pretty good. Many of the videos are given by people where English is their second language. so. There may be a little bit of a, an understandability problem. But there sure isn't with content because there's some really good stuff in there. All right. One of the things that's in there, and I just wanted to show you this. And where is it? I think it's here. Is I, I found this. This is from one of their presentations. So I wanted to quickly talk a little bit about MVC. And I know you, you so I know what MVC is. I get that. But the way we look at MVC in ASP.NET is a little bit different from the way that we look at it or looked at it last semester. So this is from one of their videos in there. 
all right? And there's only about 15 slides. I'm going to go through them quickly. I'm not going to read to you, but they explain here what the MVC pattern is. This should look familiar to you, all right? But again, this is done in the guise of using it within ASP.NET, all right? So there was that. And then they go through here and they talk about what ASP.NET is. When you build an ASP.NET project, there are probably three, four, maybe even more that you can create. The majority, if not all of the ones that we create are going to be ASP.NET Core MVC Model View Controller projects, just so you're aware of that, all right? Again, here's the functions. This is good because it really explains the model. All right. And it says not only are we going to basically have, we'll have classes in there that represent our databases or our database tables. All right. And any business logic. All right. And I've given examples before of business logic. When you think of Rankin, all right, if you want to get a grade for this class, you have to sign up for the class and pay your, your fees. That's a business rule. All right, so they talk about model, they talk about view, and this hasn't really changed. If you remember from last semester, we did work where we would have files that we call JSX files. All right, and those JSX files allowed us to put HTML inside of our JavaScript. Now, instead of having JSX files, we're going to have .cs HTML files. And those will allow us to put C sharp code, or I should I'm say it the other way. That allows us to put HTML code inside of C sharp files. All right. So there are going to be similarities. Last semester, we worked with a public folder where we put all of our static assets. It had in there things like our images. It had in there things like our CSS, things like our stat, our um, sir, client side JavaScript. Now that folder, instead of being called public, will be called www root. Why? Because that's the way they set it up. All right. And then finally, we've got the controller that doesn't look that different from the way that we've set up controllers in the past. All right. So these are the different components. And for the rest of the slides in here, they just talk about everything that's here. So here's routing. You know what routing is. Much of it will look similar, not identical, but similar to stuff that we've done in the past. Some of it will look fairly dramatically different. All right, we've got this model binding. There'll be certain files that we'll use that will act as communication mechanisms between our code, for example, and our database, all right? Validation, we done did a little bit of validation, I would say, last semester. We'll do more. We did some validation, for example, if you remember when we went into the uh, MongoDB and we put in things like minimums and maximums and required, some of that will be very similar to what we're going to be doing in here. Dependency injection, usually when people hear sing things like injection, they don't usually think of good things. All right, but actually dependency injection is a good thing in here. As it says, it achieves inversion of control between classes and their dependencies. For right now, you don't have to worry about what that means. Just know that it exists. All right, filters, as it says, well, what we're going to be doing, if you remember that when we were in the C Sharp class, we wrote some link, L-I-N-Q, near the end of the semester. We're going to write more this semester. All right. In fact, your first test is going to have link in it. I'll we'll talk about the first test in just a couple minutes. All right. But filters are things like a where statement with link. All right. Areas will matter, but not till later in the program into the course, but if you've got a really, really large 
application, you can break it up into the equivalent of a bunch of mini applications. All right. And if you do that, basically you can put each one of those in their own area. That's not a great explanation. The one they give here isn't fantastic either, but we will talk about that at a later time. All right. So when we come in, a couple things about this that I want you to see, and that's the reason I put this up here. I didn't put the yellow thing, they did. But when we come in here, we've never really set these because we haven't had to. Just get used to putting the languages, click in here and choose C sharp. For the platform, choose Windows. And for the project type, use web. So again, C sharp, Windows, web. If you do that, and then if you come in here and you do a search up here for model view controller or MVC, this is pretty much what you're going to get. And that's the one that we're going to be choosing. When we do that, we're going to get a couple of dialogues that are going to come up. And they're shown, the first one at least is shown right here. Now, this isn't new. You've seen this before. Project name, project location, solution name, et cetera. You know, that stuff isn't really new. After we do that, though, it's going to bring up. Well, it, I guess they didn't show it on theirs, but it's going to bring up something else that you're going to see. And finally, we'll get this. Right out of the box, you'll be able to run a project. But if you take a look at what circle there, you can already see some differences from what we've done before. You will automatically have a controllers folder. You will automatically have a models folder. You will automatically have a views folder and you will automatically have a www root folder. All right. The equivalent of our main is kind of the program.cs file. And the startup has just basically got a bunch of stuff the system needs in order to do its job. All right. By default, when you set this up, you will have one controller and it'll be called home controller. You'll have one model that's set up, I believe, and it's it might be an error model or something. All right. And we're going to talk about things like migrations as we get going. All right. And in views, that'll be a little bit more complex. Any of these folders that you see can and oftentimes will have um, subfolders in them, just so you know that. For instance, the www root one, I believe by default, it has a CSS folder in it and a bunch of other stuff. All right. When you create a project like this, some of the stuff that's in also in the www root folder is it automatically gives you bootstrap. All right. That's one of the reasons we'll be going over that chapter tomorrow. All right. So there's an example of some of the stuff that's in there. It's not that important right now. Um, we will be working out. Here's there's an example right here of a CS HTML file. All right. So why did I put that in there? Well, when you look at it right here, it looks almost almost solely like regular HTML. And much of the stuff that you'll see in there will just look like HTML. When you run a demo program, this is what it looks like. All right. My plan <clears throat> is to, <clears throat> excuse me, my plan is to go over chapter one, starting in about a couple minutes, and then <clears throat> go over chapter two and chapter three tomorrow, along with showing you that future value stuff. That's chapter two. And again, chapter three is on Bootstrap. All right. And with Bootstrap, it's going to be basically review. I don't know if there's going to be a lot of new stuff in there, so to speak. All right. And then your first test will actually be, We remember, we have no class next Monday because it's the Martin Luther King observance. But your first test will be Tuesday. Now, for the first test, we're going to do this a little differently. What I mean is, we're going to do probably the first half to three quarters of the class of the test together. All right, I will tape it and it will be online. All right, and then I'm going to ask you to add some stuff to it. Some of the stuff that I'm going to ask you to add, you're going to have to go and look up. And what I mean is you're going to have to Google it. 
It's not that it's hard to do. All right. And it may even be discussed a little later in the book. But for instance, just to show you what I'm talking about, this is what you get. This is your homepage by default. You get a homepage. And depending on how you set this up, you'll, you'll get a privacy page. When we set up the test, we'll have home here. We'll have privacy. And here we'll have a register and a login page. We'll have both those. All right. And the stuff will, a lot of it will be built for us. We'll change this page because I, this is kind of a stupid URL. We'll change this. We'll center it. All right. We will, we will put in there your name. Okay. And we will maybe even see if we can add some JavaScript to it to have the current date and time. So that's what would appear there in here. And again, this is something you'd have to look up. This is a very bland blase looking homepage. So my hope is we can add some bootstrap to it, maybe even bring in an image or two. We'll see. All right. So let's see. Yeah, that we don't even really need to go. That's pretty much it. What they did here was they took, they call the project demo. So what comes up in here by default is whatever you call the project. And then they show you that if you go out into your le underscore layout, dot CSHTML file that you can change that. So they changed the name from demo, the default to simply learn. That's that's their company. And then when you run it, they're simply learn. All right. How and how it changes. All right. It's not that that's that big a thing one way or the other, but just so you see that. All right. So with all that said, what my hope is then is if you have not already gone through and looked at all this stuff and have your your SQL server and, and everything and your Visual Studio done, you will be able to do it today. That's why I only want to go through chapter one today. I don't want to go any further so that people will have time that they can go back. All right. And 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 work on this stuff. The other thing too is just so you know, let me bring this up again wherever I had it. There we go. That again in here, I, I know I said it already, but I'm saying it again. This has got your homeworks for the semester. They're all explained in this PDF. You'll notice that they start in chapter three and they go through chapter 16. All right. And then we've also got in here your labs with again a PDF in here that starts in chapter two and it goes through chapter 16. The good news is this right here, this quote app, it's almost what we're going to be doing for our first test. It's not going to be price quotes. It's going to be movie quotes. I wrote it yesterday. So anything that we do in this class that we do outside of the book, if you think, wow, that really sucked, then it's on me. If you think, no, that was pretty good, it's on me. All right. Again. There are the slides for the book. I'm not going to be going over slides at all, as I mentioned. Here are the written tests, and you'll notice there's one for the first 17 chapters. I believe there's 18 chapters in the test, in the text, rather. In chapter 13, they actually have a full-blown application of a bookstore, so we'll spend a bit of time on that one. But for example, for chapter one here, you'll notice that if I bring that up, there's 16 questions. All right. So whenever I say that that's due, then it's going to be due then. All right. And when I come back up here, let's see what we said here. Chapters one through three, the material will all be due by midnight or 1159.59, as I infamously say, one week from Sunday. All right. You will have a lab day this Friday, 113. You will have a lab day next Friday, 120. So you will have literally dedicated almost eight hours that you should be able to work on this. All right. The other thing I wanted to mention to you is I found this online. This was from Tutorials Teacher. All right. This has got way, I mean, we could have almost used this as a book. As it says, it's an overview of MVC architecture. You'll notice it's 183 pages. There's models, there's views, there's controllers, there's a picture. 
They go through the history, etc. All right, they go through right here, creating an, a, a, an application. This, I literally took it and pulled this. This is literally out there as about 20 documents. I combine, excuse me, I combined them into one document and put it out here. This is something I thought you might find helpful. So as you go through here and you're like, geez, what the heck is that again? This is something that you can go back and take a look at. Again, I'm not saying it's it's got everything in it, but I sure don't think it's missing much. All right, so let me just close these. All right. So I'm gonna start, I'm only gonna go for just a couple minutes and then we're gonna take our first break. But in here, here's our book. So at, notice how it's set up. Get off to a fast start. So we'll have chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and then we'll take our first test. Then we'll have chapter four, a data-driven MVC app, and chapter five, which is very short on testing. Then we'll have another test. Then we'll get into part two. This is kind of the core of the book, and I don't remember how I split it up, but chapter six, notice more on controllers and routing, and then Razor. What the heck is Razor? We'll talk about it a little bit today, and we'll get into it, all right, even more so when we get to that part of it. Chapter eight, then, is how to transfer data between controllers. Chapter nine on session state and cookies. Chapter 10 on working with model binding. Chapter 11 is all on validation. 12 is on the entity framework core. And there's different ways that you can create a database. All right. I'm actually going to show you one of those when we take our test. It's kind of kind of cool. Then chapter 13, this is the one that's on an actual working website. All right. And this is their bookstore site. Chapter 14 is on dependency injection and a little bit on unit testing. Chapter 15 is on tag helpers, partial view, view components. So again, there are some shortcuts and stuff in there. Chapter 16 is on authentication and authorization. Finally, chapter 17, I think that's the last chapter. Nope, 18 is. 17 is on um, how to deploy. We have to do some deployment this semester. All right. And guess what you can do? You can actually, I'm not going to make a promise right now because I don't want to make a promise to you I can't keep. But my hope is that when we get towards the end of the semester, we will write a, an ASP.NET project that uses React, and then we will take that and upload it to the internet so you can have that available to you. Finally, chapter 18, you don't even, we're not even gonna go over this. It's how to use Visual Studio Code. You can write your code for ASP.NET in solely in Visual Studio Code. It's not recommended, but you can do it. And throughout this entire textbook, they use Visual Studio and not Visual Studio code. So I'm going to follow their lead. I believe you're not going to be able to run any of this stuff. I believe you're not going to be able to run any of it unless you actually have that ASP.NET, you know, the stuff I told you at the beginning, you've got it loaded. All right. So it is one o'clock. We're going to take 10 minutes right now. And then I'm going to pick it up right here on session one, fast start. I'll see you in 10 minutes.
All right, as you can see then, section one entitled Get Off to a Fast Start says chapter one introduces you to the concepts and terms you need to know. That basically is it. Chapter two, we do a very simplistic application, one page, that's the future value one. All right, as it says, you get some experience writing C sharp, model and controller classes, etc. Chapter three shows how to use classes available from Bootstrap. So again, like I said, there shouldn't be a whole lot of new stuff in there. Chapter four, it says we're going to develop a three page movie list app that works with database data. Finally, as it says, chapter five, which is another shorter chapter, is on debugging. All right. So let's just jump into chapter one. All right. It's a typical. Um, a typical Muroc book where the left hand side or the even pages are going to be all text and on the right there'll be code or there'll be tables. And then typically at the bottom there'll be a summary of what was just talked about. So as we look at this, I don't want to do this. We, we actually did this, this how static pages and how dynamic pages are processed. We actually went through that in the AWD 1000 class, so that shouldn't be new. So we shouldn't have to spend much of any time on that. We've already had our introduction to the MVC pattern, so we're, we're pretty much going to just jump right into here. All right, and then come in and talk about the tools again. I'm going to skip this part in here on VS Code. If you decide you want to try to write yours using VS Code and you get it to work, that's not a problem for me because I have VS Code. I'd recommend not doing that, but if you want to, then you're going to do it that way anyway. And then finally, we'll talk about how it works. All right, I'm going to go through all this. Then I would like to go through the example that's at the end of the chapter. Now, how long will that take? I don't know. If we can get, get through this <clears throat> and the example, and it's 2 o'clock, then we're done at 2 today. All right, if it takes till 3, then we're done at 3 today. So let's just get into it. All right. <clears throat> so the stuff that's in here, you all know what a network is, what browsers are, etc. This is the same picture exactly that they had in their other book. All right. The big difference in this class, as opposed to when we were in running in the C sharp class, the AWD 1100. All right. We were writing desktop applications. Now we're going to be writing applications that when we run them, it's going to open up a browser window. All right. And when it opens up the browser window, it's going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon, and it'll have a default port number. Now, unlike what we had with React, where we would default it to 3000, here there's a good chance that everyone in the class is going to have a different number. I think when I looked at mine, I don't even remember if it was like 7021 or something like that. All right. So again, take a read in here if you have any questions asked, but I don't really think you will. Same thing with static web pages. We're still concerned with HTTP requests. We're still concerned with HTTP responses. But unlike last semester, where we're in in most every bit of software that we wrote, we would have uh, parameters that we pass in with REQ, all right, and RES. We're not going to have much of that or as much of that this semester. All right. So again, there's the static stuff. I don't think there's really anything new in there. And then here is the dynamic stuff. We are going to be writing basically from day one we are going to be writing dynamic stuff. All right. In fact, what I'll show you by the end of the period today is I'll show you what's going to be our first test. I've got the, the app written without the extra stuff I'm going to ask you to do. Again, adding some bootstrap, et cetera, but I've got the app written and it works. I'm going to give you the database too. All right. And I mean, I've gotten to the point. I, like I said, Evan and I had a really long talk about this and you may care, you may not care. But uh, Evan is now, he is no longer the assistant department head or department chair for IT. He is now the department head. 
Mr. Corrigan has moved on and he's doing a different administrative job. So Evan is technically now the guy I report to. All right. All right. So here's our introduction to the MVC. One thing we should have talked about it last semester, and I believe that we did, was this whole idea of separation of concerns. All right. And what they're saying is it takes a little more work to set up the application, but it has benefits. It's easier to swap pieces in and out. You can have different members of teams work on different parts. So you could conceptually or conceivably have one group, a database group working on the modeling stuff and another group working on the controller stuff, and then maybe some designers working on the view stuff as an example. Most of the other stuff that's in here, I think we've talked about already. So they say that the model is in charge of the data. Specifically, it gets and it updates the data in a data store. Our data store is going to be an SQL server database. It applies business rules to that data. That's going to be basically, that is going to go work lockstep with the data validation. The view again is the user interface. All right. So as it says, it's the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. All right. That we talked about earlier. And the controller is the traffic cop. It controls the flow of data between the model and the view. Just like we talked about last semester, the view and the model should never directly communicate with one another. All those communications should take place with the controller. That's why, and I don't know if they show that picture here. There it is. All right. You see that the controller is between the view and the model, but when the request comes in, it goes to the controller. You can have a multiple number of models. You can have a multiple number of database servers. All right. And, you know, again, for us, that's not that big a thing. But in an actual application setting, I mean, imagine, imagine uh, Amazon. They probably have thousands, if not more, controllers, thousands, if not more, of models, et cetera. So there's our picture. But it, we're going to put a little swerve on that in just a couple pages. So here's some of the components. Again, we, we just went over the benefits, the drawback I already mentioned to you. And again, a little bit more of a description. This is where you're going to want to look when you are doing the uh, when you are doing the written test for chapter one. You're going to want to look because a lot of the stuff is taken right from in here. All right, let's keep going. So here's an introduction to ASP.NET Core MVC, and actually ASP.NET Core MVC, so Core Model View Controller, is about eight years old. All right. Now, that's not as old as the rest of the stuff, because notice what it says here. Since 2002, Microsoft has developed many ASP.NET programming models. All right. And they talk about four of them here. Really, the, the, the web forms aren't that different from the stuff that we were working on last semester or two semesters ago, I guess. All right. Now, they talk about some of the problems. This was the biggest problem. It used the ASP.NET format, the .NET framework. The difference between them is the ASP.NET framework is proprietary, Windows product. The .NET framework is a platform, so it works on, you know, Windows, Apple, Linux, etc. Years later, they went Windows only ASP.NET framework that web forms used. Notice, as it says, it fixed many problems. It was better. You ended up with better programs, but again, they were basically just set up for a Windows environment, right? Or implement the burn. It and 
and it's built on the open source ASP.NET core platform, also called sometimes just the .NET platform or the .NET framework. So it runs on multiple platforms. Now, since then, they have come up with this, ASP.NET or research. Using core MVC. The reason for that, and you already probably all know this, that's the name of our book, ASP.NET Core MVC. So those are the kind of, of uh, things that, that basically they develop in there, and that's what we'll be developing. Just so you know, we will be using uh, the framework version. Eve, it is still in beta testing. I could be wrong on that but we're going to be using 6.0 anyway. All right. So some of the components. When you create a new project, there are different ways that you can do this. you before the break that is the www root the model folder the view folder and the controller folder those will all be in there but if you want to do it by hand from absolutely nothing you can actually choose an empty project all right if you choose to do the route we're doing which is the core mvc usually what you end up doing is you remove most of the files that they put in there for you because if you don't they can they can cause errors because there's some system stuff in there that you probably won't be using but you've got the framework set up and the folders set up if you do an empty project you've got to add all those folders in there yourself not that that's really that big a thing so as they mentioned in this book you'll learn how to use the MVC model to develop them. As it says, it's older than Razor Pages, but it says many websites already use it, and it's not just a legacy product. In other words, it's not just something that was used five, ten years ago. It's something that's still used a lot today. All right, it says the Razor model is a newer approach. It says if you're developing a new website from scratch, you might want to do more work with Razor Pages. That's outside of the confines of this class. And that's what I'm telling you. Now, as it's it, it talks in here and it says .NET 6 has been released and it's the current version of this writing, etc. All right. It says to distinguish the .NET from the .NET framework, they refer to one in one way or the other. Not that big a thing again. All right. So again, this is kind of a, a little drawing in here. All right. So the only thing that we're not using in here, we are going to be doing razor views, but we're not going to be doing razor pages per se. And if you go, well, what's the difference? Let, let's just wait until we get into it before we start really talking about that. All right. All right. Now, one of the things we did last semester, and we don't have that now in this class, but if you remember, one thing we used a lot last semester was the node package manager. And I, I even tried to equate the node package manager to kind of being like a middleware grocery store. So it had a bunch of pre-written stuff in there that you could go and add to your program. Well, we're still going to be using middleware components, some of which we'll write ourselves, some of which we'll be able to literally bring in to our program. All right, so they do say in here, it says it gives you a lot of flexibility, but notice it says each component can modify the request before passing it on in the pipeline. Similarly, it can also modify the response before it comes back. So it's very similar in that nature to what we did last semester, all right? And then the diagrams on the next page, as it says, it gives you an idea of how middleware works. 
okay? When you write this authentication middleware, you can write it all from scratch. You can do that. It might take you a long time. You may get it right. You may not get it right. Or basically, you can just choose. So when you go in and you create your application, you can just say, I want you to provide authorization and authentication for me. That's what we'll do on our first test. And when we do that, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, we will have a, uh, a login. We will have a login link at the top of our program on the right-hand side, and we'll have a register link. And all that stuff will be available to us. Not only that, the system will automatically create a database for us so that when we register people, they will be put into that database. All right, and that's by using the built-in authorization middleware, okay? So as it says, if the middleware determines that the client is authorized to make the request, it passes it on. You don't have to use that, but if you don't use that and you don't write your own, what you're saying is your application is an open book. So for example, when we write this movie quotes app, we'll write it first and we won't put in any authorization and we won't put in any authentication. What that will mean is that anyone who wants to can either see all quotes, can add new quotes, can modify existing quotes, or can delete existing quotes. In other words, you won't, you won't anybody can perform CRUD operations. Then you'll see how simple it is. Typically, it's just you know going to be for what we're going to do at the start, adding the word authorize inside of brackets where you want to have something authorized. We'll put it in in five or four or five places. We'll run the program again. Now, when you try to go in and add a new quote, for example, you'll be you'll be presented first with a login form that says you have to log in. All right. And if you don't have if you're not registered, you'll be able to click the register link. You can still do that without the authorization. You can still set up a login. I, I, you can still register. All right. But the system that do, doesn't care, it does doesn't differentiate between people who are registered and people who are not. All right. That's what we're going to get built in by using the built in authentication middleware. All right. Then finally, as it says here, an ASP.NET Core app typically has several middleware components, not just authorization, but as it says, also things like routing. All right. So as it says there near the end of the chapter, you'll be introduced to the code that configures the routing middleware. And remember, you know, there's, there, there is a ton of stuff in this chapter. If you have not taken the time yet to look through chapter one on your own, I'm giving you the highlights, all right? There's probably stuff in here that's worth mentioning that I'm, I'm not mentioning. I'm not trying to do that. But there's probably been at least one thing or more that I maybe should have gone through and at least mentioned that I'm not mentioning. Not because I don't want to, I'm just, I have just overlooked it. As it says, as you progress through this book, you'll learn how to configure additional middleware. All right, so there'll be more things that'll be introduced. So th what this picture here says is basically everything here goes through without a hitch. All right, so you were authenticated, you were authorized, so you can do whatever you have to do and you can go through the whole spectrum. Here, if you were, if you do this and you're authenticated, but you're not authorized, boom, you skip the routing middleware part. I mean, looking at the picture, all right, should at least, it should make sense to you the difference between these. You know, more so than just, well, that has arrows and that doesn't. And here the arrows aren't the same. Yeah, OK. All right, we have talked in the past about state. You have heard about state really from AWD 1000 on. As it says, state is where things currently stand. All right, now at the beginning of December, I don't know if I ever told you guys or not, you probably don't care. But about three years ago, I developed blood clots in my lungs and I was hospitalized. It's the first time I ever had to stay overnight in the hospital. Since then, my doctor wants to see me every six months. 
All right. Well, why is that important? What does that have to do with anything? Well, I went in December. All right. And my state at that time was what my height was, what my weight was, what my blood pressure was, et cetera. And just like we all have state, our application has state. So as it says there, as the app runs, it must maintain separate state for each user. So in other words, all right, if if I go into this movie app that we're going to talk about, okay, if I go into it and I log in, so I register as me and I go in and I log in, all right, um, I can go, the way that it'll be set up originally at least is I'm the only one who, you know, I'll be able to go in there and grab any quote, whether I wrote the quote or somebody else did doesn't matter. All right. But under a true state type of system, if if I'm in there and let's say that Mr. Corrigan is in there, if I log in as me, I should really only be able to manipulate. Maybe I can see every quote, but I should only be able to manipulate the ones that I created. And Mr. Corrigan should only be able to manipulate the ones that he created. That's the way that it should work. We're not going to get there for a while. All right. But as it says there, HTTP is stateless. So it doesn't keep track of state between round trips. By now, you should know what a round trip is. So if I go back to here, that's a round trip. It goes from the request and it gets back a response. That's a round trip. All right. So again, by default, it doesn't keep track of state between round trips. Can it? Yes. Again, we will talk later about using sessions to be able to maintain state, all right? And what is that? Well, by default, typically when you set up a session for something, all right, it depends on the, the software, et cetera, that you're using, but let's, let's assume, I'm not gonna do this, but let's assume for a minute that I go out and I go out to um, Amazon, all right? And I decide I want to get another book on ASP.net. So I go over to books, I go over to ASP.net, and I put it in my cart. All right. Now I just decide, well, I'm not going to do that today. All right. But I come back later in the week, that book is still in my cart. Because the system basically set up a session for me. And it kept track. Why? Because they don't want to take, take the chance that they're going to lose out on a sale. All right. So, all right. So it says there, ASP.NET Web Forms attempted to hide the stateless nature by automatically returning state. Well, look, notice we don't care now. We care about this. ASP.NET Core MVC does not attempt to hide the stateless nature. Rather, it provides features to handle state in a way that gives developers control. It says when used wisely, I would change that to when used correctly, it leads to excellent performance. That's what we're going to be getting into in later chapters. All right, there's this is it in pictures. You can take a look at it. But basically all it's saying is to a server, if I go out and let's say I make a purchase out on Amazon, okay, I make actually make that purchase I talked about. Then I go out and I come back, oh, I forgot I want to buy this book too. So I go out and make another purchase to the web server, there's no difference between that one person making two purchases or two different people each making a purchase. That's pretty much what they're saying here. It's not the greatest of explanations, but that's the one I'd use. All right, so the tools, again, that we're gonna go through this very quickly, because again, as it says in here, they talk about Visual Studio, and I, you know Visual Studio, you know it's an IDE, et cetera. And they talk about it in here. That shouldn't look that different. We maybe didn't have the models, the views, and the controllers, et cetera. But you know the color, et cetera. You know how it's set up. You know how you click here to run the program, et cetera. There's not a lot of new stuff in there. All right. And then they talk about using Visual Studio Code. Again, if you decide you want to do that, do it. I would not recommend it. All right. Okay, so believe it or not, we're we're got a good chunk of this chapter done already. We'll finish this before two, I would think. So how an ASP.NET Core MVC app works. 
The first thing they mention in here is coding by convention. And I'm not going to read a bit of this, but I do want to tell you that it is expected that when you create things, you will use certain naming conventions. All right. So what do I mean? All right. Well, as it says, it says here within the root folder, you typically use .cs files to store classes. That isn't new. So if you add classes to your controller, there'll be a .cs file. If you add classes to your models, there'll be .cs files. Controllers, by they, they, you don't have to do this, but it's highly recommended that every time you create a controller, you give it a name and you put the word controller on the end. So for instance, when we do our test next week, we will have a quote controller, all right? By default, when you, and you'll see this in a couple minutes, you get this home controller. And all of the controllers that you create are going to, they're all going to um, inherit from the main controller class. So for instance, your controller, your home controller will have the stuff in there and it'll say home controller, colon controller, et cetera. All right. And all controllers are stored in the controllers folder. All right. And they say that a lot of this stuff isn't required for it to work, but it's a standard convention and you want to fit in. You don't want to stand out here. All model classes are put in a folder named models. All right. And you'll see there's more stuff in there than that. Some developers just, just follow this completely. And what I mean is, if they're going to have a product controller, they'll call their model product model. You can do that. By no means do you have to. View files are stored in a folder named views. And I should have mentioned this before. I did earlier, but it says all controllers are in a controllers folder or in a subfolder your projects get more and more complex, there's a better chance that you'll want to break it down so you don't have everything under controllers or everything under models or everything under views, especially with views. All right, really almost from the get go, you're going to have some subfolders. All right, it says, for example, views home. Well, views home is basically how you're going to visually represent what's in the home controller class. Views product will allow you to vis visually represent what's in the product controller class. There'll be other ones that you will end up using as well. And it says, notice again, these view files, .cshtml, they contain razor views, not razor pages, but razor views that define views for the app. If you remember, <clears throat> if you remember, when we were working, for example, when we did a little bit of work with things like, like handlebars, all right, and some of the other stuff that we use, when you'd have to go in and you'd have to put around the thing you were working with, like a less than sign or and a percent sign or something like that. We'll do some of that in here, but you'll be using things like at and at sign with the word model, at model, all right? And typically to delineate these, if you want to put in several lines, what you'll put in there is you'll put them within curly braces. Again, that's not really anything new. Finally, as we already talked about, all static files should be stored in a folder named www root. All right. And they can contain different libraries. And there's even more that it can have in there. It can have literally, I think it's a folder called Liveman or Libman, L-I-B-M-A-N, that you can use to even provide some more control in here. All right, so this is the typical type of setup then. All right, so I think this is the one they use for the example at the end of the chapter. There's a home controller, a product controller, etc. All right. <clears throat> and these are the naming conventions. Now, do you do you have to memorize these? Heck no. But I expect you to follow them. All right. So your controllers will end end in the word controller. They will be in a controllers folder. Your models, whether or not they end with the word model, is up to you. But they'll be in a models folder. 
or in, in either the case of these or a subfolder, et cetera. All right. That's all called that's that coding by convention. All right. So anybody should be able to look at your program and figure out what it is you're attempting to do is what they're saying. All right. Now, probably the hardest part of the chapter is in these next few pages. All right, how a controller passes a model to a view. Okay, so let's take a little bit of time and take a look at this. As it says here, in ASP.NET Core MVC, a model is a class that defines the data objects and business rules. The data objects are basically going to be your tables. All right, so as it says there, the figure begins by showing the code for a model named product. So what's going to happen? We're going to create something like this. All right. And when we do this, you'll see this on Monday. There is a way that when you create databases, there is a way to create databases that's called code first. And what will happen is you take code like the one like what's shown here. You basically run some commands on it and it creates the database schema for you without you having to do it. An advantage of doing that is if you get developers who are very proficient in C sharp, but are maybe not as proficient in databases, they can get a lot of the work done for them. All right. And again, you're going to see that as we go on in here. All right. So again, in ASP.NET, the controller is a class that inherits from Microsoft.ASP.NetCore.MVC.Controller. All right, so that's where the it basically is. We're going to be working with actions. Notice that an action is a method of a controller that returns an act action result. You're going to see this, all right, as we start going into here. And again, what I'm shooting for here is as we as we go from chapter to chapter, is that you understand what we're talking about. I'm not saying that you're able to recite it chapter and verse. I don't, I'm not saying that you have to memorize it, but that you understand the process. That's what's important. All right. Okay. So it says there to do that, a method can use a built in view method to return a type of action known as a view result. Again, a lot of code in here or a lot of stuff, a lot of terminology. Before the break, I showed you that. PDF that I that I put together for you. This stuff is all explained in there in a lot more depth and breadth of coverage than what you see in the book. And they give you an example. It says the detail method is an action. All right. And basically, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to show you the details for an individual record, whereas the list will show you all of the records. All right. So again, there's your model class. No difference in how you create this. All right, you'll accept you'll be in a models folder. You'll right mouse click on that folder, choose add, go down to class, or choose add new item and choose class. Give it a name like product. Typically class names are singular in nature, no S on the end. All right, and then you'll put in all of the components. Okay, here is a class and, and you'll find it since since these are going to be database tables, you're not going to be adding methods here. All right. There is an initialization that's being done right there, but there are no methods in here. Okay. And then as it says, here's the code for the controller class. And all I want to mention in here is first of all, notice namespace guitar shop dot models. The name of the project is guitar shop. And we are in the models folder down here. Namespace guitar shop dot controllers. Again, that's that code convention type of an idea that we were talking about. And in order to be able to use this, as it says here, we got the using statement in here. That's going to allow us to do this ASP.NET Core MVC to do the controller work. This is bringing in the work right there. All right, and you see again how product controller again inherits from controller. Nothing really new there. 
All right. You can also see that detail returns an I action result. All right. So notice here we're working with an ID. So it's going to return the information from that particular record. So we're saying to not to list, but give me the details of just that one record. But the key takeaway here is we got that passed into it. Here for list, we have nothing passed into it. All right. We're just saying that we're going to set up a list of products and the db.getProducts is basically it's going to call a method that's going to loop through and get them for us. And then we're going to return all those to the list view so that it spits out all of the products for us. And again, if you don't like my death, my, the, my explanations, go back and read the chapter and especially take a look at what's in here. All right. So how a view uses razor code, tag helpers, and bootstrap classes. The bootstrap, we don't have to go over it very much because it's going to use it in a way very similarly to what we've used bootstrap with in the past. All right. It says here, most, most of a typical view file contains HTML elements. So that's what you see here. What's different? The stuff in yellow. All right. So here what we're saying is we're using the product model in here. We're also coming in here and we're using this. We're using some view data. This is an example of writing razor code. It starts with at model, all right, or at least an at sign, and it's within curly braces. So here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. So with his details, what we're saying is we want to be able to create a table. Notice we're using the table class, table bordered, and table striped. So we're using bootstrap classes right there. And then we're saying go out to our model, product ID, then go out and find the name, then go out and find the price. All right. There'll be a little bit more to it once we get into it a little bit more. The other thing to notice is right in here, this looks almost like really, when, in my opinion at least, if I grabbed all of this that's in gray here, all the way from the H1 through the end of the table, that's other than those at models, that's just straight HTML. All right. On the other hand, when you go down here, notice ASP controller, ASP action. All right. Why does that matter? Because this is a button, and we want to give this button some, for lack of better words, power. And what we're saying is this is going to be working with the home controller. So when we press the button, we want to go to the home controller and in particular, the index view of the home controller. So when we press this, we want it to go back to our home page. All right, they didn't have to call it home, but that's the idea. <clears throat> the, the difference is though, these are prefaced with ASP dash on there. All right. Okay, so let me jump back for a second. It says there a view file can also contain razor code that lets you use C sharp to get data from the model. Also format it and display it. They did do some formatting on there. The formatting they did, and I went over it or glossed over it, is they they took the price and they ran it um they printed it out using a currency format. All right. And as they say there, there's more than one way you can work with Razor code. As it says, to start, the app model specifies the class for the model. Now, what's confusing is there's an app model lower case and there's an app model uppercase. The lowercase, as it says, specifies the class and the uppercase. <clears throat> model property lets you access the model objects that's created from. What does that mean? Lowercase, but when we're accessing it, it uppercase. All right. And if you don't do it right, it won't work. All right. So as it says next, the view file can also contain razor code. 
that lets you use C sharp to get data from a model, et cetera. I guess we did look at that. All right. And then they run through what's happening in here. It's pretty much what I just told you. All right. It says there after the at model directive, there's an at sign followed by curly braces, which again means that you're going to be using a block of code. All right. If there's just one line of code like we've got here, you don't need any kind of at sign. All right. But here, <clears throat> all right, we could potentially be adding more stuff in here. I don't th I think it's because we got the add model project here. I think that's why we need the, the curly and have it set up like this. All right. But you need the add sign here and you also need it here. I don't think it would matter. I, and you could try it if you wanted to. I didn't. I think if you put this, not the at sign, but the model dot product ID and the model dot name and the model dot price. I think if you put those in curly braces, it wouldn't hurt. It would still run. All right. But it's it's superfluous. In other words, it's unnecessary code. So you're you're getting code bloat by doing that. Next, as it says in here, all HTML attributes that start with ASP, the ones I showed you, those are referred to as tag helpers. It says they're defined by C sharp classes. So in other words, you can look at it as it's more middleware, but it's built in middleware. So as they mentioned, you can use this to make coding attributes easier. It results in less code than you having to go in and manually put in a lot of stuff yourselves. In a view, it's common to use the class things and they talk about bootstrap, we already have. All right, so again, nothing really new, so to speak in there, all right? All right, so how the program.cs file configures the middleware for the app, all right? Now, I don't know if I'm gonna show it here. No, they're gonna show the CS file, but it's at the bottom of your program, just so you know, it's gonna be there, all right? So as it says, it shows the code that's generated for the program.cs file. It says this is the one used for the Guitar Shop app. It configures the middleware that's used, it builds the middleware pipeline, and it says you'll learn more about this, not just in the next chapter, but throughout the book. So notice what it says there, because this stuff, it's over my head, but it's stuff that will be done for you automatically when you set the project up. So it says there, it begins by creating a web application builder object, then it adds code, or it, that contains code that adds services, so what your program needs. All right. It says you only need to use the add controllers. This is the key. The key thing is right here. This says that our program, our ASP.NET program, is going to use controllers, and those controllers will have views in there. And again, the controller will be called like home controller.cs, and the view will just be called home, but it'll go with the home controller. All right. You'll see some of this as we go on in here. Next, as it says, again, this is in here, it's coming in and it's indicating whether or not the app should use a secure connection. So it should it be HTTPS or should it be HTTP? Again, we'll go through this more as we go through the book. All right. Then they talk about bringing in Bootstrap. Then it says the next statement marks the position where a routing decision is made. Well, what is that? Well, you know what that is. That's kind of like our API stuff. So if we say a local host, what they're saying is this and this are gonna give you the same thing. In both cases, you're using the home controller and you're going to the index method. Here you're using the home controller, but going to the about method. Here you're using, these two you're using the product controller and you're going to the list or to the detail method or action as they're referred to here, all right? Then finally, it says the fifth statement here consists of the map controller route that maps the controllers for their actions. So it's letting it know what is associated with what. When you work with some of this stuff, you will be using things like question marks in here. And they mention in this case, when you use a question mark, that means that something, typically it means something is optional. 
All right. You may use a question mark also. You'll see this later on to delineate or basically to say that it is possible. All right. You'll use a question mark not only to say that something is optional. All right. But I'm losing my train of thought and I don't know why. But you're, you're also saying with a question mark that it can contain nulls. All right. So it says, as a result, if you, the user specifies product detail one, it passes one to it, all right, so it knows what it is. If it's product detail, it'll probably by default show you everything, all right? But in the example they gave here, there it is, ID question mark, whoops, all right, ID question mark right there, meaning that again, it's optional, all right? Now, I don't expect that every single bit of that made sense. I mean, I'd be pretty stupid, to be honest with you, if I did. But before we take our break, it is 156, but I want to see if I can do this very quickly before we take the break. And then we will. Right at two. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to go into Visual Studio. And I'm going to create a new project. And I'm going to go here. I've already got it set, but set the languages to C Sharp. Set my platform to Windows and set my uh, type to web. All right, then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to type in MVC. And you can see how that's way down. And there's a core web API. There's a core web app, you know, model view controller. There's this core web app, you know, et cetera. All right, this is the one that we care about. So I'm going to go there and I'm going to click next. Now it says, where do you want to put it? Well, I, I I'm going to have been doing it the same way I did it last semester. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a new folder. And I'm just going to call it junk because I'm going to get the break. All right, so I've got this junk folder. So now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to call this junk app. If I want, I can have, have the project and the name here the same. I don't want them to be the same. So I'm gonna call this junk solution. You don't have to do that, but you get the idea. Then I'm gonna come into here and I'm gonna tell it on my desktop, I wanna put it in junk. So I'm gonna select that folder. So I've got junk app in the junk folder and junk solution. I'm gonna click next. Now it asks me what framework I want to use. All right. and will want 6.0 and that's what you get by default. There are some earlier ones for legacy and this one, which again, I think is just brand new, but we're gonna keep it at 6.0. Configure for HTTPS will normally be yes. So if we want to, we can have it be HTTPS. Docker is something over and above this class. So I'm gonna click create. All right. And here's my project. I don't know, not now. And uh, you'll notice there's my controllers folder that has a home controller in it. There's my models folder that's got a model in it. All right, et cetera. There's my views folder up here. There's my www root. This has just got a bunch of links if you want to go through those. All right, I'm going to close that and I'm going to run the program. This is right out of the box. I've done nothing. What this is going to do is in my views folder. Oh, well, you can you'll be able to see this here. It's coming up. So, so it came up and it gave me for a port number 7284. Again, yours may be totally different, but it's now it's loading and it's putting the stuff in. So there's the name of my app. There's my home page. There's a privacy page. All right, I can click here. It's a working link. All right, and the last thing I wanted to show you about that, let me stop the run here, is again, virtually everything that I've talked about in here is shown in here. All right, it is two o'clock. Let's take a break. We'll come back at 10 after two. And when we do, I'm not gonna look at this one anymore. And maybe I will for a couple minutes, but I'm going to bring up the one that's at the end of chapter one in your book, and we're going to take a look at that. So it's two o'clock. Please come back at 10 after two. I'm getting a new water.
All right, I think I've pretty much gone over what I wanted to on this one, but um, as far as the one that's in the book, for chapter one, it's, believe me, not a very grand and glorious um, site at all. It's fine, but it's nothing special. Now I'm looking in here. I be, I may have, let's look. Let me go to my C drive here. I don't think that when I did this, I don't think I put the student download in here. And that's got the examples that are in the book, so. I'm going to I'll I'll make sure I do that and I'll update the the repo right after class. In fact, I'm just going to go and add it right now. The student download. I'll copy it in here. as that's loading. Um, summary and. OK, so what they have in here is it says use Visual Studio to run the guitar shop. There's really not much into this. This is going to be an ongoing project, just so you're aware of that. All right. <clears throat> so what's in here for chapter one isn't that that big or that big a thing. You may want to take the time to go through and look at some of these just because of the fact, like I said, we're doing something brand new. But as always, of course, that's your call. So here. I'll go to the exercise solutions. Oh, they don't put in chapter one. So oh, that's great. So that well, let's just bring up. We'll bring up this chapter two future value. How about that? There's a bunch of them. That's interesting. What I'll bring up. There it is. There's the guitar shop. It's a book app. <clears throat> so there's not real much in here. But a couple things that I did want to mention. All right, the first uh, first one is if I go in and I open up the views folder and I go under views and I go under home, you'll see there is an about and an index because there's an about page in here. There's going to be this is to list one product. This is to list all products and this layout. This is the file. This layout file. This is going to be basically the layout file regardless. So the stuff that we put in here, what we're saying is we want to make this available to each and every page. All right. <clears throat> and you know, if you look in here, it's a CS HTML file, but it's got the doc type and everything else. Now, one thing we're going to talk about more in the next chapter is this view bag. And the view bag is like, what the heck is a view bag? It's basically a it's it's basically I guess you could look at it as being more again like middleware that is available and it's you can put anything you want in it and take out anything that's in it, but it allows you in many ways to go and take information and route it for lack of better words between the model and the controller. So what we're saying is we want to be able to have the title on each page. We want the boots, bootstrap to be available on each page. We want this site.css file. And this is just basically saying render the body for that page. So this render body is going to come in. And if it's the about page, all right, it's going to render that. And if it's the index page, it's going to render that. So when you take a look here, <clears throat> Okay. 
there it is. And like I said, there's not much in here, but this is viewing a product. This is viewing all the products. All right, when you click view, you get the detail. That's that detail thing they talked about before. And they put in about us page in there, so you could put any garbage in there you want. All right. <clears throat> Let me show you. I think I've got it here. I better have it here. The movies app that we are going to be working on. So again, we will look at doing this on Monday. Let's see. Where did I put it? Quotes. I think it's there. So I went out to imdb.com and found I grabbed 50 of their most of their 100 most famous movie quotes that are in there. All right. So what we will be concentrating on for this test is writing a quotes controller. So we're going to basically write most of this from scratch. All right. And then under data, you're going to learn what migrations are. And you can see I made a migration right here. It's got yesterday's date on it, 2023. 0110 and if i open that that's the database that got created for me the, the table structure the database and the table so i put a table in it <clears throat> and that table had in it an id the name of the movie the quote came from the actual quote itself and who said the quote all right i i just put the movie character's name in there all right and then we've got the model all right, this is an error model. This you get by default. You can remove this, but this basically is just the model that's going to run when you get errors. All right, this is the quotes one. You can see how simple it is. All right, I didn't know if it complained if I didn't have a uh, constructor in there, so I just put one in and it's empty. But again, we've got an ID. We've got, and the rest are strings. The name of the movie, the name of the, or the quote itself, and the author. All right, so if I run this, and I made some more changes to it, so you'll see it's not going to look exactly like the other ones looked. So what I did was I came in here, changed the title, and it says quotes taken from this website. And if you click on this, in a new tab, it opens up where I got the quotes from. All right, and then um, for the privacy policy that's right here, all right, literally, it's going to open up again a new page right here. And I went out to basically this Termify where you can generate your own privacy policy. So we've got that. And then when we run it, we go to home. That's all it does. But if I go to quotes, these are my 50 quotes that are in here. Now, I didn't implement pagination or anything. We're not talking about that right now. All right. But you'll notice if you look in here, Rick Blaine. Rick Blaine, Rick Blaine, et cetera. So if I come in here and I do a quote search and it says, give me a name of an author who made this quote and I put in here, Rick Blaine, all right, and I search, now it's got just the four from Casablanca that Rick Blaine made. On the other hand, if I go back, okay, and I didn't put a back button, I guess, in here, but I can put in a new quote from him if I want or somebody else. I can do that here. OK, and if I go back to the list here and I put in as an example, quote search and I put in Rocky. Notice it's all lowercase. It finds the one quote. Oh, it should have. Wow, what happened there? There it is from Rocky Balboa from the movie Rocky. All right, and you can edit here. So you can go back in. So if I wanted to add, you know, and save it, you can see, well, I have to find it, but wherever it is, well, let's just bring it back up in here. You can see it now has the extra two on there. All right, so I can edit. I can get details where it just shows it, you know, line at a time and I can also go back. Well, I don't know why that didn't work, but I can also go back and delete. I'm not going to delete it. I wanted to leave it in there, but all of them are here. 
You'll notice also in here, I'm logged in. If I go to log out and I go in and I try to bring up the quotes, it says, hey, you're not logged in. All right, now I set it up for the remember me, so it remembers me. And I just literally put this in here as JP Scott at Rankin. I don't remember what this was. I think it had to be six characters with like a number or and a special character or something. I don't remember what it was. I didn't try this stuff, just so you know. But I could come in now and I could register somebody else. But again, if I get out of this and I try to do anything here, a quote search, anything, it's not letting me do anything. I can log in or register as somebody else. So I'm going to register at hello at goodbye.com. And for a password, I'm just going to put in one, two, three to show you there's some stuff built into this. Password must be at least six and more, no more than 100 characters long. So I'm going to try one, two, three, one, two, three, and see if it takes that. And it says, oh, you didn't put in the same uh, a con a confirm. So one, two, three, one, two, three, and register. Now notice, must have at least one non-alphanumeric character, at least one lowercase, and at least one uppercase. So I'll come in here and I'll put in hello with a capital H and a zero in there. So hello, capital H-E-L-L-0, -L comma, comma, comma. And then I'll put it in again capital H, little e, L, L, zero, comma, 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 and then I'll register. And it doesn't actually go and send something there. It just basically says, hey, if you want that, just click here, and then it confirms it. Okay, so now when I close this, I have to go back again. And if I go back to my homepage, there I am. But now notice, I'm not registered, but if I do log in, and I, it remembers the last one that was in here, and I log in. Now, if I go to quotes, there they are, quote search, I can do that. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you every bit of code to do this. This is what we're going to do on Tuesday of next week. All right. And right now, this says enter a quote author. And it does. That's not a problem. All right. But what I'm going to ask that you do next week is to add some Add some uh, bootstrap in here. Um, attempt to add an image onto your homepage. I already told you about changing this around. All right. And also, we're going to do the quote search. I'd like you to do a movie search also. So rather than entering a quote author like we did, like Rocky or whatever, you'll be able to enter in here like Casablanca. And this will say search for movie. And when you click it, now it's not finding anything because I don't have any quotes from a quote author named Casablanca. So hopefully, at least, that makes a little bit of sense as far as what we're going to do. What I would, again, very, very strongly suggest is that by class tomorrow, I mean, go back and look at that if you haven't. It'd probably be a good idea. But... I'm hoping it together, you're not gonna have to turn this in. You've already will have the completed product. I'm gonna first show you the future value apps that I created. These will all be sent to you. And the one that they create in here, you'll notice it's a little longer chapter, not much, a couple pages than the last chapter, but we're going to create this from scratch. I think it would be in your best interest to follow me as I go through this. All right. I hope you know to be able to follow it just line by line almost and not have any errors. We'll see. It's a very or a fairly, I should say, a fairly simplistic app. So how to create it, that doesn't take much time. Run it. They talk a little bit about errors. Then we add the model. All right. Then we organize. Then we validate. And when you get, I, I think it's in here, but I'm not positive. Let's see. The app itself is actually fairly simplistic. I'm trying to find it. It's not it.
There it is. So that's what we're going to create. And we'll set it up originally so there won't be any validation in it. So what will happen is if you leave these blank or you put something illegal or whatever, this will just stay at zero. It probably will even take negative numbers. I didn't try that. But then we'll put the validation in more than we did, more than I showed you before with that, you know, with that word authorized. In fact, I didn't show you that, so I should. To put in that authorization that I mentioned to you, all we really had to do was to come into our quote controller here. And anytime we wanted the person to have to be logged in, we put in the word authorize. When you put it in there the first time, it gives you an error. And it says, I don't know where that is. But if you click on the on the error, it gives you that little thing and you have to basically add this. Because that's where it's been defined. All right. And there was one more thing. Oh, and also just in case you don't remember it. Right. Come on. There we go. Come on. There we go. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check in here for the word contains. There it is. That's link. So when we first do it, we're, we're going to leave out this part of it and it's going to return everything. Then we'll put that in so that when we put in Rick Blaine, it only gives us the quotes that Rick Blaine has made. All right. So again, please, by tomorrow, please take a look at Chapter 2. Though that'll be new. There's a lot of stuff in there we have not yet covered. All right. If I come in here and go to about page, I don't know, 82. I think I'm going to get an error here. It always does this. This is a stupid red shelf that they've given me to use this. Well, what I was going to show you, and it's not coming up, but was chapter three again is on bootstrap. If you do need, I was going to mention this tomorrow, but I might as well say it now. Should have went into YouTube to check that out, but this is pretty long. It's almost three hours long, but in freecodecamp.com, I think it's the I lost my internet connection for whatever reason. All right, I'm just going to call it a class. I will talk to you tomorrow. I'll see you then. Uh, Mr. Chubb. Yeah. Uh, so there's you. There's basically no work to do, right? For, for today, there's 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 going to be nothing that's going to be due until a week from Sunday. There's nothing, no work from today. Okay. So yeah, I, there. Just to clarify, there's nothing due this Sunday, correct? There is nothing due this Sunday. That is okay. correct. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, I think that's that's it. I'll just I'll talk to you tomorrow. No, that that's fine. Okay. See you tomorrow. All right. Yeah. See you.